proposal of this virgin. In other words, remember that word proposal, when you think of your Franciscan history, refers to the propositum, the penitent way of life that the, the penitent uh, decides to undertake under the guidance of the bishop. And banding together as one, they ran to the place, obtain, attempting to obtain what they could not. They employed violent force, poisonous advice, flattering promises, trying to persuade her to give up such a worthless deed. And the Latin word here, where the worthless deed is vile, vilus, this dirty, filthy action that you have taken, abasing yourself, and then it, the text goes on, that was unbecoming to her class and without precedence in her family. The taking hold of the altar clause she bared her contradiction, and not to be you know, Italian operetta here, but you can see, <laughs> but you can see Claire saying, "No, never," and, and holding on to the to the altar as they're trying to to pull her, and saying, "It's too late now," and, and, and taking off her veil and revealing her contradiction. I have made a decision, and just as in some ways, just as much as Francis becoming a penitent, in a sense, this act of the tantra had made Claire also a quote, church person, and in some way immune from civil prosecution. She had taken an act, becoming officially now a penitent, which made her a subject of the church. And so they realized that their, their arguments and their persuasion could not dissuade her. Um, and it said, though, though for many days she endured the opposition of her relatives, she stayed firm in her decision. Yes. What's the source you're using? This is right now is from the legend of Claire uh, itself, the legend, let me see the exact note here, uh, this is uh, part, part one of the legend about Claire's birth and conversion, and paragraph number nine. In what book, maybe you could hold that well, up? Well, this, like this is, in, unfortunately, this isn't the book that you missionaries have. The legend is in the Claire of Assisi early documents. Uh, really, the only autobiographical documents you have unless some people have already purchased this book that I mentioned uh, last night was out of print. Um, the, the legend is not in the writings of Claire, because again, Claire herself did not write it. Uh, so that the only things in here that are really autobiographical as such are Claire's testament, and where she reflects on her decision to follow uh, Christ in the way of Francis and her rule in the central part of it, which is the autobiographical part. Uh, so that's the legend, again, based on what the witnesses said in the process of canonization, some of whom were Claire's own relatives who, who testified at the time of the process. She stayed here, however, only a short time. And afterwards, St. Francis moved her to another place. Sant'Angelo de Panzo, which is uh, up above Assisi on the lower slopes of Mount Subasio. Uh, Francis, Brother Philip, Brother Bernard accompany Claire to this new place. Now, for many years, again, we know this name from the legend and from the, the witnesses of canonization that, that Claire went to Sant'Angelo de Panzo. But for many years, we weren't sure exactly what this place was. It was assumed by many people that, in fact, it was another Benedictine monastery. But the work of recent years by Mario Sensi in Italy and others have shown that this, in fact, was not a house of nuns, but a house of devout lay women, devout penitent women. Uh, the term used in Italy at this time to describe these women was Mitsoke. I gather from what some people said uh, that um, I know some people uh, that are Italian ancestry, this term is still used, at least in southern Italy, to refer to uh, somewhat of a woman, an old woman who hangs around the church, uh, the devout lay person who is kind of always around uh, praying in the church or hanging around the sacristy and so on uh, type of person, uh, this term Mitsoke. But at this time, it referred to a type of lay woman penitent life, somewhat similar to the movement in Northern Europe at this time that were called the Beguines. Mm. That is, women who lived in what we would call a commune today, um, pooling their goods together, 
living a simple, poor life, devoted to prayer, devoted to works of charity, who supported themselves by work, the work of their hands. And unlike nuns, who typically came from the aristocracy, Benedictine monasteries at this time typically were composed of the unmarriageable daughters and, and widows of the aristocratic class. And by unmarriageable daughters here, I don't need to detour on that. I don't mean somebody who is ugly and can't find a man, although sometimes that might be the reason. It basically means that a aristocratic father had too many daughters to provide an adequate dowry for him that if he had four or five daughters, and of course you wanted to be a big spender, you wanted to show how wealthy you were and put a big, have a big dowry for your eldest daughter and maybe your second daughter and maybe your third daughter. By the time you get down to the fourth or fifth daughter, there's not enough money to go around to give your daughters an adequate dowry. So many times such a girl, such a young woman would be sent to a monastery, sometimes quite young in her life as a child oblate. But monasteries were typically the feudal aristocracy, in a sense, if Claire had been there, she would have been among her own type of people. The, the, the Beguines, the Bitsoke, typically, on the other hand, were more the middle class people, the working class people, or professional people of the town, women from that type of background, who had decided to devote themselves to God. The, uh, these Bitsoke were not a religious order. Uh, they were not even formally organized in the same way that later the the secular Franciscans or, or, or penitent brothers or sisters would be. In other words, they did not have any official vows or promises or obligations. The, the fact was, I have committed myself to live this way of life, but if something turns up, I, you know, I'm free to leave, and there's no kind of penalty attached to that. That I, I am freely choosing to live this simple life in common with people, and in fact, most of them did stay the rest, most of the rest of their life. But their life was largely a contemplative one. In Northern, Italy, or Northern Europe, they tend to be a little bit more active, but in Mediterranean countries, given the social climate and the role of women, they tended to be a little bit more enclosed in their way of life. In any case, Claire goes to live with these Beguine-like women, uh, if you will, semi-contemplative women who supported themselves by the work of their hands. Some modern commentators are saying, in fact, that this is where Claire got the idea, uh, although she should have got it from Francis and the Friars too, namely that we should support ourselves by the work of our hands, not li living by land and endowments, but supporting ourselves by our contributions uh, and, and what we contribute in terms of the actual physical work that we do, which again would have been a real step down from her social class in terms of her values and ideals. One thing we do know, and during this time that she was staying there, her younger sister, Catherine, decided to join her. Catherine ran away from home and came to join Claire here at San Angelo de Panzo. Now Catherine was only about 14. She was four years younger than Claire. And uh, she apparently had been engaged, at least a marriage deal, marriage contract had been struck, and in fact, apparently the wedding date was set in the future, that when this marriage will be consummated, when in a sense she is brought to the home of her husband. And so she's breaking a business deal here. And maybe you can see Claire's family maybe resigning themselves to the fact that Claire has decided to dedicate her, her life to God but they're not about to have a second daughter follow this example. And so we know that the family now, and we know there's seven strong knights in Claire's family, uh, her, her uncles and cousins came to San Angelo de Pazzo to get, uh, to, to get Agnes and bring her home. And really, Agnes, when you read the descriptions, I mean, she was really a victim of, of abuse. She was assaulted physically uh, as they beat her and attempted to drag her literally out of the house and, and, and bring her back to Assisi. By the way, this shows, this incident shows the value of a cloister. Having a cloister was not entirely a bad idea because people couldn't use physical force at San Paolo or Claire had not. She was safe there. But this son, uh, Angelo de Panzo, was not technically a convent. 
It was not a religious house. It did not have a canonical cloister. It was just a commune, we would say, of devout women living there. And so, in a sense, her family did not feel that same awe or scruple in coming in and, and, and breaking in there and attempting to bring Catherine back home to Assisi. The sources tell us it was Claire praying that Catherine would have the strength to resist that, according to the legend, and here we might be dealing with the more legendary aspects of the legend, but in any case, uh, according to the legend, that Agnes, or I should say Catherine at this point, her name still is, Catherine becomes so heavy that they gave up. Uh, and they, they gave up, they couldn't lift her, they couldn't pull her, uh, and <laughs> they, 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 couldn't, <laughs> they couldn't move her back to Assisi. Uh, um. And it's at this point, after this, that she stays. And it's at this point that St. Francis changes her name. Uh, we know her in history as Agnes, Agnes of Assisi, Claire's sister. But Francis, in a sense, gave her this name uh, because, like the virgin martyr Agnes, she stood stern uh, against her familial pressures in her dedication. And again, Agnes, the virgin martyr Agnes in the early church, was a, young, a woman about the same age, a young woman about 13, 14 years old stood very firm in her dedication, resisting the pressures of her family, and became a martyr for Christ. And in a sense, Francis, if you will, gave Catherine this, quote, religious name, this new name, to denote her new identity now as a martyr and a witness for Christ because of her heroic stand against her family. Two things. One, it sounds like the, the modern interventions, when somebody goes off to become a member of some religious group, that, that, that's an that, interesting point. Um, that you know, they think that they can go in and take these people by force and take them out and, and reprogram them, so to speak. But then the other point on Agnes, it's a form of the term Agnes, which is a lamb, which is a sacrificial animal, and so mm -hmm. in the martyrdom, I don't know whether the first Agnes was named that because she was martyred or that was her name before she was martyred. It just happened. Or yes, I don't know that. Uh, I have to check that. But the, but, the, but the liturgy of St. Agnes was very important, in, and I think I mentioned it already, the, the liturgy for that feast of St. Agnes was the liturgy that was often used at the time of uh, when a woman would make her religious consecration. They would say the Mass of St. Agnes. Uh, in fact, uh, in Claire's later first letter to the other Agnes, Agnes of Prague, um, she quotes from the line, from, from the antiphons for the Feast of St. Agnes. When you have loved him, you are chaste. When you have touched him, you become more pure. When you have accepted him, you remain a virgin. In other words, playing on this, on this union with Christ, that unlike the embrace of a, of a, of a, of a man, uh, you, you are becoming more uh, devoted to God uh, through this. And, and that liturgy, uh, was used by, or alluded to by Claire herself later on. Finally, however, um, and it says, the sources simply say that Claire's soul was not at peace here at San Angelo de Panzo. And perhaps it was because these women did not have the type of poverty that Claire wanted to have. They, they owned their possessions, they had things, uh, they lived simply but they still owned their possessions and, and had incomes of various kinds. And, and again, this was seen by Claire perhaps as a temporary resting place. The other thing is that was perhaps going on is Francis was readying San Damiano uh, for Claire and converting it, we would say, doing the necessary renovations to the structure uh, that would, would equip it to be a residence for women, that there could be a woman's residence attached to San Damiano. Of course, remember, this was the first church that Francis had rebuilt uh, at the time of his conversion. In fact, working on that in 1206 is what precipitated his break with his father when he sold the cloth in order to get money for the construction project of, 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 of San Damiano. But then Francis had left it. He had repaired it and left it and gone, starting to repair other churches, the little church of St. Peter 
and then St. Mary of the Angels, and San Damiano remained there, repaired and restored, belonging as a little chapel to the Bishop of Assisi. And now we see the bishop turning San Damiano over to Claire and now her sister Agnes and several other women, Pacifica del Puglia de Guapuccio, one of Claire's childhood friends, as long as another sister, Beneventa of Perugia, again perhaps a distant relative of Claire, with whom her family may have even lived when they went to Perugia uh, to stay there during the Civil War in Assisi. We see four women now forming this community and coming probably late in 1212, September, October of that year, down to live at San Damiano. Uh, Father Bigaroni has done a lot of work on San Damiano and published an article several years ago in which he talks about the construction there. Um, I don't know if you can focus in on this, Patrick. Uh, but you see here the top picture shows San Damiano as Francis restored it. Um, and you can see here it was probably a more Benedictine type of structure that is showing having a crypt, although the other, some other historians disagree with that, and then steps raising up leading to the sanctuary area. Uh, in fact, if people have been to Italy, there are a number of Romanesque style churches like this that you see in various places where the, the choir and sanctuary area is raised above the level of the church. Some people even speculate, was there even already, in some ways at some earlier time that had become extinct, a small Benedictine monastery attached to San Damiano. But this bottom picture shows the work that Francis did. So this is the main way he may have restored it in uh, 1206. This bottom picture shows the work that Francis did and, in, in fixing it for the Clares, and perhaps even in his original work, he, he leveled out the floor, as you notice here, uh, so, so that it did away with this more hierarchical type of structure uh, of, of the church, and it leveled out the floor to keep everything on the same level, the uh, nave and the choir of the church. And then, of course, if you've been to Assisi, building the extensive the dormitory on the roof so that the building now is equipped to be a residence. And some authors have even speculated uh, that Claire reflects in her, in her rule and testament that when Francis saw that we were not afraid of hard work, uh, that he gave us this form of life to follow him. Some are speculating that perhaps even Claire and these women who joined her actually joined in the construction project and Francis really began to realize these ladies are serious about giving up everything, about following Christ, following Christ in his poverty. So that from the very beginning, I think it is quite clear that we see it's not in Claire's mind and it's not in Francis's mind that Claire is going to live the same kind of itinerant life as Francis and his brothers, that she is going to have much more than Francis, a place, a home, place where she can continue living the life of her that she had chosen, chiefly devoted to prayer and, and contemplating the presence of Christ, but now in a situation of institutional poverty. So this is one, at least one hypothetical reconstruction of, of the accommodation of the Church of San Damiano to house Claire and her community of sisters. It's important to see, too, that Claire sees herself as adopting Francis's evangelical life. That this is not two gospel projects, not Francis's way of life, and then over here Claire's way of life. That Francis sees herself as following Francis. It is one. We are both living this radical life according to the gospels. Now, because of social conditions, because of men's roles and women's roles, we're going to have different ways of doing this in medieval society. But we are living out of the same gospel vision. And Claire reflects then on the fact that Francis wrote a way of life for her. She quotes this later on in her own rule in uh, chapter 6 that we'll be talking about uh, later when we talk about Claire's uh, way of life. But sometime in these early years, 1212, 1213, Francis writes a form of life for Claire and her sisters. 
and we don't have the whole form of life. But again, we don't have the early form of life of the Friars Minor either. We only have their rule as it had evolved up to the time of 1221. We don't have both the primitive way of life that was given the verbal approval of Pope Innocent III in 1209 for the Friars, and we don't possess the, the, the primitive rule of the players. We do have, however, a nugget from it that was its gist, and it is this, and again quoted by Claire in the sixth chapter of her own rule. Because by divine inspiration, you have made yourselves daughters and servants of the Most High King, Heavenly Father, and have taken the Holy Spirit as your spouse, choosing to live according to the perfection of the Holy Gospel, I resolve and promise for myself and my brothers to always have that same loving care and solicitude for you as I have for them. And we see here three very important elements that we'll in some ways talk about a little bit more later, talking about Claire's values. We see First of all, the divine inspiration, the fact that Claire, as Francis, was very much aware that it is God who has called her. It is God who is leading her. And that her decision to lead this way of life was a work of God in her life, that she was attentive to the working of the Spirit, and it was the Spirit which had led her. The second thing, uh, that you have chosen to live according to the perfection of the Holy Gospel that she, like Francis, was trying to follow the gospel purely and simply. The gospel in particular for Claire was, of course, the message of the self-emptying of God for our sake, and that she was called to imitate Jesus by also engaging in this emptying of herself according to the form of the Most High Poverty. And third, that she was part of this Franciscan movement that Francis would have the same care for her as he has for his own brothers, that you are part of my family, you are the people to whom I have dedicated myself to. It's interesting enough, Francis never calls himself the father of Claire, but always her brother. And if he wants to use a stronger term, he will say, I am Claire's mother. And Francis even used that phrase, that, as he did to his own friars, the bringing to birth the nurturing, the caring that is characteristic of a mother's role is what he saw. Not that he, and then again, you have to think of medieval biology here, not that he was the source of life, which the father was in to medieval biology, the way people were conceived in medieval terms, but the mother was the nutritive element that brought the seed that God has planted to fruition and development, and that Francis sees his role more in that encouraging um, role rather than, in a sense, a directive role. Other things about it we don't know very much about this primitive way of life. Certainly it was characterized by poverty. That Claire and her sister supported themselves by the work of their hands. That they refused to accept lounged endowments or revenues like Benedictine nuns or living decent, comfortable life in some ways as the Itzoke did at San Angelo di Panzo that they supported themselves simply by the work of their hands, accepting no properties. They had no money in the bank, as we would say today, nothing that would guarantee them an income, but living simply from day to day, and in that sense, renouncing the rank and the privileges that were accrued their status in life and had emptied themselves for the sake of Jesus, as Francis and his brothers did. Secondly, their life was basically contemplative in orientation, a life of prayer and devotion to God. And like many penitents, and again, Claire could read, Claire and her sisters could read, and therefore, like other penitents who had devoted themselves to a gospel way of life, they began praying the liturgy of the hours. Like Francis's rule for hermitages, in a sense, that one can read and see how the life of those devoted among the friars to more contemplative focus was organized around private prayer and then coming together for the uh, celebration of the hours, we see Claire and her sisters probably at this stage adopting that type of life. The third thing was fasting. Uh, Claire adopted quite severe physical penance. She refers later to her instruction, when she's giving Agnes of Prague uh, instructions about how to live, and she says, she said, well, all I'm going to tell you is what St. Francis told, you know, what we did. 
San Damiano, she said, except for the weak and the sick, whom St. Francis advised and admonished us to show every possible discernment in matters of food, none of us who are healthy and strong should eat anything other than Lenten fare, either on burial days or even on feast days. Thus we fast every day except Sunday and the Nativity of the Lord, on which days we may have two meals. Um, so we see the sisters living an extremely severe life in terms of bodily penance. Again, fasting at the Middle Ages meant, first of all, eating basically uh, coming on towards evening. In other words, people who had gotten up early in the morning, five o'clock, the cock crow at the first uh, rays of light, and even before that, if they were celebrating the, the night office, wouldn't be eating their meal till two or three in the afternoon. So it would be equivalent for us, people getting up maybe around seven o'clock, not, not eating till, you know, about four in the afternoon. So that you're going the bulk of your day really on an empty stomach. And the other thing she refers to of Lenten fare refers to the fact that the sisters never ate meat or even dairy products, were considered, which were considered white meats in the Middle Ages. Anything that was a product of animals, such as, such as eggs, um, milk, cheese, these things were forbidden under Lenten food. So Clara and her sisters had a harsh regimen, and in fact we know that Francis came in and, and tried to persuade Clara to give up some of her bodily austerities um, in regard to fasting. And it was a much more central value to her than it was to him. Uh, and she had to even be persuaded by the Bishop of Assisi because she did not totally listen to Francis' advice on this. That's another thing, too, that we see with Claire, and I maybe just want to throw that in, that she did not totally passively accept everything Francis said. Uh, this is one example of it in regard to his fast. And the other one that she alludes, the process of canonization alludes to, is that Francis asked her later on, to accept five women into the convent at San Damiano. And she said, I'll take four, but this fifth one doesn't have a vocation. And Francis said, well, yes, she does. And Claire says, no, she doesn't. Uh, and, uh, but I'll take her anyway, but she didn't last. And Claire said, see, I told you uh, that, that she, she's, not, she's not just a, uh, again, this, this kind of totally passive person. Francis was her former and the person who guided her in many ways, but she, was strong enough to live her own life. The next thing that we see happening, and again, this early life comes in some ways to the notice of the larger church, and in some ways is forced to stabilize itself. First of all, Claire's community begins to spread. We see other similar communities of penitent women which take on the style of life of this community at San Damiano, uh, looking at this, what some historians call the, the Damianite school of influence. That is, this little community of San Damiano begins to become a model or a beacon for other similar groups of women in that part of Italy. Some of these communities may even go back before Claire, of women who had started communities, but now begin to look to her and to her way of life as a way on which they can pattern theirs. We do know in 1217, a new community was formed at Foligno, and we know from the records that Claire was present at the foundation of this community. So she left her uh, dwelling in the CC to travel over there. By 1219, there are other similar houses in Florence, Monticelli, where soon Claire's own sister, Agnes, would be sent as the abbess at Perugia, at Monte Lucido, at Siena, at Lucca. This movement begins to spread around Umbria and Tuscany. And because of this, it comes to the notice of the larger church. The Fourth Lateran Council was held in 1215. And one of the things that the Fourth Lateran Council had decreed in Canon 13 of the Council was that there should be no new religious orders. That if someone wants to start a new community, they have to base their way of life on a canonically approved religious order. At this time in the Western Church, the only two rules that are approved by the tradition of the church were the rule, 
of St. Benedict and the rule of Augustine. So that if a community was going to be established, it doesn't mean a new community couldn't be established, like the Cistercians establishing their new order, or the Canons regular of Premontre or other groups. Different people started new religious houses for different purposes. St. Dominic, for example, founding his own order of preachers. But they had to be based on an existing rule. So, for example, when St. Dominic founded the Dominicans, he adopted, the Dominicans profess the rule of St. Augustine. And then they have a set of constitutions which specify that rule of St. Augustine for their own way of life. So here they, they're saying to communities, adopt one of these rules. And this was the pressure on the friars, as we know. But Francis himself was under the gun after the Fourth Letter Council, because they had only gotten a tentative approval in 1209 for the Pope. And the point is, you, this thing is not going to last. And this is when Francis arises in that outburst and says, don't talk to me about anybody else's rule about Benedict's, about Augustine's. I have been called to follow the Lord in my own way. So if the Friars Minor, who are, in a sense, the, the group with which this small community of San Damiano is affiliated with, if these Friars Minor are only a tentatively approved group, what does, how does that even put the women who are in relationship to them even less so, even less recognized by a approved group? What does, how does that even put the women who are in relationship to them even less so, even less recognized by ecclesiastical authority in their way of life? What kind of life are you people living? How do you fit into canon law? Where are you in the code of canon law? What kind of community are you? Where do you fit? This is going to be the question the church is asking. And, and, and many people see two things that happen right after this as evidence that Francis and perhaps even Bishop Guido of Assisi uh, begin to say, we have to protect these sisters at San Damiano and their way of life. One of the things that happens is that Claire is urged by St. Francis to take on the title of abbess. And the witness of canonization says that Claire was very strongly opposed to taking upon herself this title from traditional monastic orders. And Francis, in his own rule, says no, no one in the friar is to be called an abbot or a friar. But in a sense, he's concerned with these women. Not that Claire was going to act like a traditional abbess, but if she has that title, then people can say, who's this? Oh, this is the abbess Claire. Oh, they must be Benedictine nuns or something, don't they? So that, in other words, if she has that title, it will make her look more like she's a traditional religious order and, and will be accepted as such. The other thing that we see happening at this point is Claire's writing to the Pope, Innes III, who was probably her distant cousin, uh, re requesting the famous privilege of poverty. That is a guarantee that I will not be forced into a Benedictine model in regard to my way of life. That unlike monasteries, which, which have the ownership of property. I do not want to own property, and I want some kind of guarantee from you, Holy Father, that I can follow my vision of living in poverty and simplicity. And so in 12, late 1215 or early 1216, Innocent III issued this privilege to his beloved daughters in Christ, Claire, and the other servants of Christ of the Church of San Damiano in Assisi. As he says, it is evident you have renounced the desire for temporal things, desiring you to dedicate yourself to the Lord alone. The one who feeds the birds of heaven and clothes the lilies of the field will not fail to clothe you, will not fail you in either food or clothing. Therefore, we confirm with our apostolic authority, as you requested, your proposal of most high poverty granting you, by authority of this letter, that no one can compel you to receive possessions. In other words, no church authority, no, no family of one of the sisters can say, I will give the Church of San Damiano possessions to give these women an endowed income. And again, this is traditional. And later on, many of the poor Clare convents would depart from this because they say, we can't found a convent. We can't establish a convent here 
unless it has a certain guaranteed revenue. And Claire wants to break away from that. She wants to be able to say we're just going to live day by day with what we make from uh, our earnings, from the work of our hands, our, our sewing, or other things that we do, and handiworks. We will live from what that brings in or what people in their generosity give to us and bring to us. So that Claire has then this privilege of poverty. The second thing that happens is in 1217, Cardinal Ugolino enters the picture. This man, who was a relative of Pope Innocent III, perhaps his nephew or a cousin, but a member of the same family of the Desaini, is appointed papal legate to Tuscany and Umbria, that is, to represent the Pope and to investigate the situations of the church there. And he hears of the phenomenon of this new type of community. And he writes for guidance to the Pope. By now, his uh, cousin Innocent III is dead. The new Pope, Pope Ovalino III, is giving him guidance on this. What shall we do, he says, about these types of women? Ugolino wants to respect the fact that these women, many of whom belong to aristocratic and prominent families, have a right to live the way of life that they have chosen, which is different, which is breaking the mold, in some ways, of the patterns of religious life. He wants to respect them, but at the same time, he also wants to adhere to the decrees of the council that if they're going to be recognized as church, um, as church foundations, as official church people, they have to follow an already approved religious rule. So he's in somewhat of a quandary here, and he writes to the Pope for guidance. And the Pope tells him that there are two options. They can be under the guidance of the local bishop, and his instructions, in which case they don't need a rule. They're just equivalent to what we would call today a diocesan congregation, which are following the leadership of the bishop. However, if they want to be independent, if they don't want to be under the local bishop's thumb, if they want to govern their own communities and, and live their life with a certain degree of independence, then they will come under the jurisdiction of the pope, and they will have to accept the instruction and the guidance that the pope will give them. And that instruction and guidance soon comes. Uh, Ugolino appoints a, or a Cistercian monk. Ambrose and Cistercians were the ones considered the experts in religious life and religious renewal at that time. They had a lot of practice with legislation and general chapters and such. He sent a Cistercian monk named Ambrose to investigate not simply San Damiano, but these other communities that we mentioned, uh, to go about and, and see their needs and what needs to be done. And the result of which, Ugolino, as papal legate in 1219, issues a rule uh, for what he calls, interestingly enough, in the title, the Paupores Moniales Recluse, in Latin, uh, the poor enclosed nuns. So you see, Certainly, Claire would be comfortable with this, that they are poor women. But the, this term, moniala, is that they are nuns, that they are enclosed, uh, involves a certain, in some ways, change in their way of life, or at least stabilization in their way of life. This rule of Ugolino, this so-called rule of 1219, is not really a rule, because it states very clearly that the Claire and her sisters, and indeed these women in these other communities as well, are following the rule of Benedict. Um, the way it begins, somewhat, what is very strict. Every true religion and approved institute of life endures by rules and regulations and certain disciplinary laws. In other words, you can see the very tone of this thing is to, quote, rein in these girls, to, to, to to say, okay, you people are going to follow the mold for religious life. We have certain things that have worked in the past, and if you're going to become recognized by the church and be official, you're going to have to fit, you know, get with the program. And this, this is what it is, and I'm going to lay it down for you. And as he says, 
Uh, we give you, therefore, as he says, the rule of St. Benedict to be observed in all things that are in no way contrary to the following form of life given to you by us and by which you have chosen to live. So therefore, the canonical foundation of their life is the rule of Benedict. The sisters professed, if you will, the rule of Benedict according to, as specified by, the, you might say, constitutions which Ugolino drove up, drew, up, uh, drew up and gave to the sisters. One of the th keynotes of this document, and we'll talk about uh, some of the other things later, one of the keynotes of this document is its imposition of a strict cloister. Now again, to say that Claire was basically contemplative in orientation is different than a strict canonical cloister. And that is the very first thing that Ugolino mentions after having imposed the rule. As he said, it is proper and a duty that all those women who, after condemning and abandoning the vanity of the world, have resolved to embrace and hold to your order, should observe this law of life and discipline and remain enclosed the whole time of their life. After they have entered the enclosure of the order and assumed the religious habit, they should never be granted any permission to leave this place, unless, perhaps, some are transferred to another place to plant or build up the same order. In other words, once these sisters are in, they can never leave. The only possible exception is to go to establish a new community or to send sisters up to help a community which might be in trouble and needs more personnel. You can send sisters out to another house. But otherwise, they cannot leave. And this, of course, has been one of the great points of discussion that uh, has occupied many contemporary Franciscan historians. Was the cloister foisted on Claire? Uh, and it's understandable some Third order Franciscan women, especially in the United States, have kind of proposed the view, well, if Claire had her choice, she'd be like us, namely teaching or running a hospital or doing some kind of active ministry, we might say, for the sake of the gospel. Um, and indeed, that has been backed up by a certain line of historians, and most notably Bishop Mormon, the, the, the famous historian of Franciscanism, the Bishop of the Episcopal Church, or the Anglican Church in England, that says, in some ways, Claire wanted to live like Francis and her hopes were dashed. Others say this is not true, uh, especially Sister Chiara Lainati and other poor Claire authors who tend to say, no, the sources indicate that they were, quote, recluses, and again, that word doesn't sound good in English, but that they were basically contemplative women from the beginning. In other words, there was no law that said they couldn't go out, but basically they stayed home and, and devoted themselves mainly to prayer contemplative activity. That doesn't mean they couldn't leave or didn't leave on occasion for something came up, but that their life was basically a contemplative life and an orientation. Indeed, it seems to me this latter interpretation has more evidence uh, in the sources than that Claire would have been much more active if she had a chance. But they would have still probably, if things had not gone the way they did, conceivably remain something like the the a lay state maybe or, or a, a, a state of consecration somehow in the world in yes view, in other words, uh, what, what, in other words they might not have become official religious yeah that, i mean that's quite true that they might have been contemplative basically contemplative oriented women living in poverty and simplicity but and consecrated and living in their homes or something of that nature well they were living not, they weren't living in their own homes i mean they left their homes that was part of what they had done. You know, they had left their homes and their families and had... So they would have formed a community. Yeah, right? formed a community that was living a, in a poverty. A physical community. Yeah, because when they were living in their homes, they had properties and possessions. In other words, that would, would be the distinction between um, what would be the friars and later the poor clares and then quote, the brothers and sisters of penance, or what we would later call the third order, who were still living in their own homes. In fact, that was the difference often described for the brothers and sisters of Pence living in their own homes in the world, as opposed to those who had, quote, left the world and left behind 
their homes and left behind the properties and possessions uh, to live in, a, um, in this radical type of commitment. But you'll see later in Claire's own rule, when she talks about the cloister, when she gets a chance to write her own rule later on, she will say the sisters have to remain enclosed, except they may leave for a useful and evident purpose. In other words, she's a little bit more liberal in terms of what they can leave for. So I think it's basically to say that she herself shows this more contemplative orientation. Um, in any case, we'll continue next time and, and see and examine uh, how Claire, it seems like things are being pushed on her. And indeed, it begins this long struggle of Claire with church authorities who think they know better than she does what she wants to do. And we'll continue next time with how Claire begins to forge her own way of life um, out of her own experience and finally writes her rule and what some of the gospel values in her rule are. Okay, so, yes? Well, what about the, the one thing that you um, wanted to include about her canonization. Oh, okay. I think this is a good point. Yes, I think one of the things I, I mentioned was that I thought it was interesting in the actual bull of canonization that was drawn up by Pope uh, Alexander IV at the time he proclaimed Claire's canonization in 1255. One of the things that was cited by him as an example of her holiness was the fact that she had resisted the Pope. In other words, he, as he refers in, the, in that bull, and, and our holy predecessor, he didn't say holy, is it our predecessor of happy memory, Gregory the Ninth, who was, of course, Cardinal Lugolino, um, after he had become pope, was trying to persuade Claire to accept possessions and felt that the sister should have this property. But it was cited as a mark of her holiness by the Pope Alexander IV that she stood up to and that she remained true to her vision and refused to be dissuaded by anybody. Uh, it's very interesting here, too. She writes, uh, and also I have another place where she can, you can check that, is in the second letter she writes to Agnes of Prague. Um, this is the second letter to Agnes, paragraph number 17, and she's talking about follow, follow poverty, prize it beyond the advice of others, cherish it. She said, if anyone would tell you something else or suggest something that would hinder your perfection or seem contrary to your divine vocation, even though you must respect him, do not follow his advice. And as Father Regis says in the footnote, this is the Pope. Although you have to respect the Pope, stick to your guns. <laughs> uh, and I think that's very interesting that, that I think obedience in a Franciscan tradition does not necessarily mean let everybody roll over you. I mean, it means it means giving respectful assent to leaders, but it also means standing up and saying we have also to, true to our vocation and and uh, <coughs> how church authorities in some ways have to listen to what, what we are saying <coughs> because we have trying we are trying to capture a certain way of life uh, and fight in some ways for your right to live that life. Certainly she was obedient in the sense of accepting, in one way, living with what people said. She said didn't say, no, I'm not going to accept this. But she says, okay, but I'm still gonna I'm still gonna come back and ask for what I want. Uh, and, and to come back and, and keep coming back until she her life her her decision is recognized. Okay, well thank you very much. <coughs>